What's up, sons? It's Blind Run with Son of a Tech once again, and today we're going to take a look at the Gigabyte GTX 1070 Mini ITX Overclocked Edition. And I'm pretty excited because this has the potential, 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 potential to give us a good amount of power in a small form factor. Stick around. Right out of the box, you can tell that this was built for Mini ITX from the get-go as everything is pretty compact and it's shrunk down to about the size of a reference 1060 PCB, which is not actually the size of what the 1070 and like 1080 PCBs are, which are actually kind of lengthened out quite a bit. And those coolers that come on the Founders Edition actually cover the entire PCB, unlike where on the GTX 1060, you'll have like this plastic cap at the back of the cooler to lengthen it out. The card features a black and orange color theme on its shroud with a 90 millimeter single fan for our cooling potential and underneath that of course is a beefy heatsink. And I say beefy, I really mean beefy. This thing actually has active cooling for not only the core but also the memory modules as well. And taking a look on the back of the card you can even see there's a, a sort of hold down plate over those memory modules. And I I found that design pretty interesting and intriguing and it made me more excited for the potential of this card to be great in a small form factor. Moving around the card we can see that we have a 8 pin power adapter and this is actually sporting a 5 plus 1 power phase which is an improvement over the standard 4 plus 1 power phase on the rest of the GTX 1070s that I've seen. This is relevant because that means that we are getting a bump in just components in general and the entire board seems to be be kind of improved over the entire range of components. The last thing visually that we can see on the card itself is if we move around to the outputs, we have two DVIs, a single HDMI, and a single display port. This is out of the norm for what you would typically see on the rest of actually all of the Pascal line where they usually have opted to drop the second DVI in favor of a second display port. Now, I'm not really sure why this decision was made, if it cut down on costs for parts or what. I would expect a a second display port or really because it's a mini ITX and that's kind of the aim or the focus a second HDMI might be more beneficial than a second DVI I find it very odd and the reason I say that is because you would usually or typically see these in some sort of home theater PC build and it would be really awesome to have a high powered graphics card in your home theater area so we kind of went over the VRMs being actively cooled and we went over the core and kind of that heat sink that's under that shroud and how does that translate into cooling? Well actually not as bad as you would think. If you leave the fans to stock profile, the fans won't start spinning until the temperatures get up above 70 degrees Celsius. At this point, it usually ramps up to about 60% and stays there during my testing. At this 60%, we had about 72 degrees Celsius, which is pretty good and that's under load. However, if you want to adjust your own fan curves and bump this up a little bit at 100% fan speed with 20 passes and fire strike we never broke 62 degrees celsius at 100 percent fan speed you are looking at about 3400 rpms on that 90 millimeter fan and let's go ahead and take a listen to what it sounds like right now Alrighty, so from the DB test I was able to do, which is actually only with my phone, I do use a pretty 
well-tested app that from what I can tell from reviews is within plus and minus 4 dB as long as you're above that 40 dB mark. So at 60% I don't think I can get you anything accurate but at 100% I can tell you that it's about 50 decibels which isn't really that bad when you're talking about a card this size. Now while the TDP is advertised at 150 watts on the core itself, I did go ahead and do a full system check with the kilowatt and at this point it looks like we're hitting about 225 watts and that's plus or minus about 10 to 20 watts depending on what you're taking a look at. As I have already kind of stated before, I run the AX860i on this test bench, which is platinum rated, which is about 92% efficiency. So you're looking at about 10% there, eight to 10%. So with the improved components and of course the improved power phase design and some decent VRM cooling, what happens to overclocking? Well, there's pretty good news here. On the core clock, you see the standard overclock of 2025 megahertz. This is across the board with almost all Pascal cards, unless you bump down to the 1060s that are more apt to get about 2100. But on the 1070s and the 1080s, 2025 is about standard. Even if you get above that, you end up throttling back down to 2025. I think the highest I ever saw this card get to was about 2078 megahertz, but it didn't stay there long. What was impressive though is the amount of overclocking we were able to get on the Samsung memory modules which actually hit an entirely unbelievable 2352 megahertz that I just wasn't expecting at all and I'm very impressed with and this is the highest overclocking memory I've had on a Pascal line from the get-go albeit I've been doing a lot of EVGA cards and uh yeah, so that's all well and fine. We need to see how it performs in games and benchmarks. Starting out with Time Spy at default settings, we had a score of 6,509. So we're not quite there for 4K gaming on a mini ITX form factor, unfortunately. This means that we need to be about 7,000 or above for 4K or entry level 4K is what I would call it. And we're not hitting that. We're about short 500. Moving on to Fire Strike with the default settings we had 20,427 which is pretty damn high and as you guys can see I have the 1060 and the RX 480 for you guys to compare that to because those are the last cards that I ran in these tests. So moving on to real world gaming, we have Rise of the Tomb Raider on high in DirectX 12 and we had a minimum FPS of 41.9 with an average of 127.2 and a max of 207.5. That max is incredible, isn't it? Holy crap. So this is just the basic preset for high settings if you guys want to run it on your system and see what you're getting. Moving on to Total War Warhammer on the Ultra preset in DirectX 12, we had a minimum FPS of 68 with an average of 78.9 and a max of 101. And finally wrapping things up, I had to throw a UWP game in there and of course my favorite is Gears of War 4. So taking a look at that with 1080p settings in Ultra with Async on, we had a time between frames, smaller is better, of 9.5. This is actually pretty incredible as the Titan X Pascal line is only at about 8 milliseconds or 8.5. So it's really, really low and I was super impressed with that. The minimum frame rate is also impressive with 81.9 FPS with an average of 105.4. So in conclusion, this is one of the more exciting cards I've seen come around lately and it's actually starting to become available now. It wasn't so available when it first released and I was able to pick one up and I really was looking forward to it. And as you guys can tell from the review, here and all the details and, and stats, it is legitimately a fully functioning, full-fledged GTX 1070. You're seeing all the numbers that you would expect and you're actually seeing some better numbers on the memory side 
which is pretty cool. A couple things to note if you are trying to put this into a mini ITX case, keep in mind that it is still full length PCI. So it's not going to be the half height, it's going to be full height. And if you are looking at temperatures, if you are going to be putting it into a mini ITX case, just make sure the fan is able to breathe a little bit and I think you should be okay. The biggest downfall of the card, in my opinion, which is interesting, is actually just putting on that additional DVI. Now, in the past, I've said, why isn't there a DVI, for example, on the reference RX 470s and 480s? Because I feel like those cards target that market. I feel like the GTX 1070, especially in a mini ITX kind of form factor, is more advantageous to have something like an additional HDMI port. While all of the tests were in 1080p, I do feel like this is a full-fledged 1440p capable card and you should check out the potential of upgrading to it if you're looking into a better resolution. Thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe down below and don't forget to ding that button if you want to see more videos from me and check out the Patreon. It's sonofattack, patreon.com slash son of a tech and it's in the description and until next time i'll see you next tuesday